Welcome to Stir Crazy. I'm here for the first time with the fabulous Jacob Drew. Hey guys, <laughs> we're, finally, we're finally doing one together. <laughs> we're getting back to that little bit of normality again. We can't wait to get the bars open. We're in our little beach bar, Halulu, to talk about both our passion, which is rum. And uh, yeah, Jake is going to make an amazing cocktail for you in a minute. But first of all, we'll just go through what's in the box. Jake, yep, yeah, so what's in the box? So guys, as always, you've got your... So with our, like we've done with our previous tasting boxes, you've got your six bottles. These are going to be the rums that we're going to be tasting, one to six. You've also got a couple of pouches labelled one and two. And then you should have some unmarked bottles as well, guys. That's going to be our first drink as well, so get those to one side. Um, uh, so I would go ahead and grab yourself six sort of identical looking vessels. as you know, That's the best way to measure out all your spirits that we're going to be tasting. Cocktails uh, wise guys, the first cocktail we're going to be serving up in a coupe or a martini, so you want to grab yourselves one of those. It's also going to be a shaker drink as well, so shakers on hand, well as always, like we always say, haven't got a shaker, you can use anything like we've always said, like a container, a jar, anything that you can get some ice and the liquid in, sealed it and give it a good shake. Uh, for the second drink, we're going to be doing, uh, it's going to be a highball, we've got a, a very, very fancy very hard to obtain a uh, zombie themed highball here, but obviously your standard highball that you've got at home will do for that. And then the final drink guys, it's gonna be sort of Negroni old fashioned style, so you're gonna need yourselves a rocks glass, and then also a mixing glass for that one as well, guys. And that's all the equipment you're gonna need, um, and that's everything that you should have. So I guess before we get going with all of our rums, let's make our first drink. Yeah, so I'm just gonna uh, grab the ice, and then I'll be back whilst Jake starts talking you through it. So this drink, guys, it is a, in essence, we couldn't do a rum tasting box without highlighting arguably the bartender cocktail, the one that everyone loves. Uh, we always joke that this is sort of, if you think a chef will judge a new chef on how he makes an omelet, we judge bartenders on how they make these cocktails. So this is a daiquiri, uh, but this isn't just any daiquiri, guys. This is a super, super special daiquiri. Uh, this is uh, inspired by, I believe it was the second Doctor, Doctor Inks channel? Yeah, I mean, um, kind of, kind yeah, of, on that sort of... It was our travelling journal that we did, yeah. so it was the second one, we won uh, the UK's best themed drinks list for this, so we all went up to London, we got pissed, and had a great <laughs> laugh, and yeah, it was a great one. This was one of my favourite drinks from this, and it was featuring a drink that was released back in 2015, and it's this amazing plantation pineapple rum, and this was sort of the brainchild and evil love child of two people who were just super passionate about rum and it was one of them was Dave Wondrich and he wrote the book Imbibe. Uh, highly recommend it, gives all the history of uh, cocktails going back to Jerry Thomas and really goes into detail of Jerry Thomas's very first cocktail book. So he did that and he kind of found this absolutely delicious rum and it's made every year by bartenders macerating pineapples over in France with Maison Ferrand and the other person who did it with was a guy called Alexander Gabriel and he's the owner of Maison Brand, one of the oldest cognac producers in France. Mm. So yeah, it's just, uh, we'll get to that a little bit because we're gonna be tasting one later on and we can talk all about plant plantation a bit more. But yeah, this is kind of badass because they send over 50 bartenders each year to shut pineapples, destroy their hands, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and then get them really drunk as payment. And so uh, it was this drink that was created originally and launched at a thing called Tales of the Cocktail. And it's kind of iconic in the bar industry where bartenders uh, go up against each other, all the best bars go up against each other and they crown the world's best bar, world's best drinks list, all of these great things. And this one, world's best new product. So uh, yeah, it's awesome. And so we've done what every bartender loves to do with this product, which is make a daiquiri with it. Yeah, definitely. Jake, I'll let you go away, carry on with making the daiquiri. Yeah, absolutely guys. So 
what we've done for this one as well. Um, so the we'll talk a little bit more about it in it, but the, the rum that they use for this one it is a darker style of rum or a more aged style of rum. Uh, and with our daiquiris, we kind of prefer them to be a little bit on the lighter side. Uh, just we don't want the rum. We want everything to be in harmony. We want everything balanced. So what we've done is we've taken plantation pineapple and we've blended this with uh, our own sort of pineapple infusion where we've taken Havana Club three year, which we'll be tasting in this class. Um, and we've taken some roasted pineapple and made our own sort of infusion just to give it a bit of a lighter style, adding in some, some Cuban rum as that sort of your standard that you're going to see in the daiquiri. So I've got a blend here, guys. So this is going to be... So guys, this is your little unmarked bottle. So yes. it's the larger one there. So unmarked bottle. And we've got two unmarked bottles. We've got another little one there, which is our uh, sweetener and sour with that as well. It's our lime yeah. sherbet. So that's, a, that's 25 ml each of the plantation pineapple. So it looks like when we talk about it. And then for, uh, the pineapple infused final glove. Now, if you want to grab your second bottle, guys, this is a combination of lime sherbet and Vanilla syrup. Uh, what we've done as well is we've acid adjusted the lime sherbet as we, we when we make our daiquiris at Dr. Inks We'd like using lime sherbet instead of sugar uh, Traditional daiquiris would have used sugar and lime juice because it just you add sweetener But it means that that lime can still really zing and come through and it just it just makes for an amazing daiquiri So we've done lime sherbet a little bit of vanilla for sweetener And then we've just acid adjusted that just to keep it nice and tart like we were like for our daiquiris And that's it guys. That's both bottles now that we need to do is just add some ice into our shaker. I've got some nice big cubes here. On there as well, I'll just... Yeah. And then as well, guys, just make sure... <laughs> there we go. Uh, get a nice cube in your glass as well, just to get it chilled, and make sure the glass is nice and cold. So yeah, the nice thing about this, as you said before, these uh, this plantation pineapple, the way they make this is, I'll let Jake shake this away, and uh, we've got the glass chilling away here as well for us at the moment. Um, and the way we way this is, uh, they make this is they actually take two of their benchmark rums. So the first thing they do is they take this absolutely stonking three-star uh, pineapple. And uh, this, uh, this one here is from Jamaica, Barbados, and Trinidad. So you've got three English colonies and they are absolutely legendary rum makers. And they've done this, they age it uh, for about two, three years and it's just a belter. So what they do with this is they take all the skins of the pineapple, they macerate it in this rum and then they redistill it. And so you get this distillate that is a pineapple skin distillate. The next thing they do is they take their original dark, which is, uh, Again, an absolutely delicious, delicious rum. And it's much more aged, it's aged in oak barrels, and it basically what they do is they infuse the pineapples for three months. All of the flesh of the pineapples go in here for three months, and then they age it all again in cognac barrels. And then it's this last aging that just really rounds it off and gives this lovely finish to this Stiggins Fancy Pineapple Rum. Now, the great thing about this as well, it's called Stiggins Fancy Pineapple Rum, and it's named after uh, the Reverend Stiggins, who was in the Pickwick Papers. And uh, so it's, he had this absolute love for pineapple rum, and so the whole thing is inspired by that, and how they would have made them in these Victorian uh, recipes. And that's where David Wondrich comes in. He's just this historian extraordinaire who creates amazing stuff every time he touches something. So I think we're ready to pull Yeah, so just yeah. basically add some ice into that, guys. I've given it a good hard shake for about 10 seconds till the shake is nice and cold. Then yeah, all that's left to do is just give a strain off into your glass. As we said, daiquiri is one of these things. It's the it's the omelette. It's that master stroke that we make, and it's the perfectly balanced drink. It's simple. It's got three ingredients: just usually sugar, lime, and rum. And this one, we've got this lovely layers of complexity with those pineapples in it. And so, cheers, Jake. Cheers. Happy birthday! <laughs> it's yeah. our it's our birthday as well. So we're pretty happy birthday. birthday. And it's uh, yeah, you know, uh, we started this a year ago, and. Uh, this time last year, it was just kind of mental. No one knew what was going on. It was all getting uh, absolutely nuts. And so Stir Crazy was born. And uh, it was that kind of flash of thing where we decided we were going to put stuff online. We did masterclasses. Jake would host gin masterclasses and things like that, and absent masterclasses. 
at Dr. Inks. We also did them for things like the Devon County Show, where we'd get up on stage and do these masterclasses. And we just thought, well, we can call this and put it online and send, it, send some drinks out to people and see what happens. Uh, it was a mental thing where it, where it was a, a year ago and when we first started doing this to where we are now and how we do things and <laughs> looking back and thinking, how the hell did we run it like that? Why were we doing things like that? But yeah, it's, it's been a mental year and it's been incredible to see, especially some of the guys out there that have been with us since we started this a year ago. It's, you know, it's... it's yeah, we've had people come along on the journey every week for yeah. a year. It's been amazing. I mean, um, who knew there were so many great, great, great pissheads in Devon? Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so this drink, when we yeah. get back to this, is like, you'll get this, it's this lovely roll off the palate of rum and pineapple and lime, and it's just all, it's just sexy as fuck. It is, it? and I, like I like it, but what I like is it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't taste like you've just measured in pineapple juice or just thrown in a big cup, like, it's pineapple-y, but it's still got that zing, that daiquiriness, it's still got that hit of rum. That's, yeah. It's also clean on the palate. Yeah. Now, this does make, on its own, an amazing, uh, daiquiri. However, my one complaint with making this just on its own with as a daiquiri is using dark aged rums, they're really full flavoured, big powerhouse flavour bombs. And a daiquiri is a aperitif cocktail, that's why we're having it first. It's that one to get your juices flowing in your mouth and it's, it's, that, it's that short start snap of flavour that we want from it. And that's why white rums work so well and we'll get on to that in a minute when we get to Havana Club here. And, um, the one thing that Plantation Three Year Old uh, Three Star does as well, it's got that lovely short start snap of flavour, which is what you want from a light rum, and that's what daiquiri is all about. So using big dark aged rums, they kind of mess with the flavour profile a bit too much for me, and it, it's that cleanness of the palate. And so that's why we blended two different rums with this. We used that to give that lovely rounded pineapple flavour, but then we macerated in a sous vide uh, Havana Club rum with caramelised pineapples to give the lovely extra layers of pineapple there. And so, yeah, it just really opens up the palate. And I think that's just a, yeah, it's absolutely delicious. Absolutely delicious. delicious. And, the thing that, cheers. and the thing that you always know with rums is rums, they, they are brilliant at being, they just blend together well. Rums love being blended with other rums and you can create really incredible, complex, you know, that's where tiki came from. It was blending of rums and blending of flavours. So you can layer rums into create. So you can take a daiquiri, which is quite simple, and then make it into something a little bit more complex just by simply splitting the rums or trying something different, trying a combination of things. And it just, yeah, it just lifts the flavour up. Another thing, other good things is like, we call it splitting the base. Yeah. And so you have a base spirit in any cocktail. And when you split the base, you're putting different base spirits together, those strong spirits together to make more rounded complexity. And that's kind of what we've done here, but we've taken a pineapple rum and we've made our own pineapple rum, we've split those together. But you can do it with things like the early ones, like Shasha and Agricole, which give all these other different flavours to splitting the base, and they will layer up that flavour and give you flavour bombs. Again, things like these overproofs, you can add that in, and it adds funk to a drink. And so what we wanted to do today with rum is really show you, a lot of people's idea of rum is like spiced rums, like Bacardi Spiced or Captain Morgan Spiced, dark rums like Gosling's or Captain Morgan and things like that. Uh, or they have the light rums, which they have in a mojito. They don't really understand the category and they might all be a rum from a very specific region. And so what we're gonna do is break that down a bit today and it's it's gonna challenge you a bit. Some of these rums are hardcore mm -hmm. uh, and we wanted that to be that. We want to show the versatility of rum. And this is just scratching the surface. So there oh, are so yeah. many more there as well. And we'll talk about a few of them as well as we go along. Um, but yeah, I mean, the first one we're gonna, what, what I want you to do is I want you to get out all your rums, put six glasses out, mark one to six, you should have all your little bottles, put one in each and put the bottle just next to it so you know which one you're doing. And we've got the bottles in front of us, so it's easy for us. But that way you can refer back to it. Also have some water to hand. It's good to rinse your palate a bit and go back between them and taste them. The very first rums we're having, they're quite hardcore. And we want to start you off that way to challenge you and just really you'll be like, they'll blow your head off. But when you start drinking more of the rums as we go through, it'll get smoother and smoother. Your palate adjusts. So uh, yeah, so get all your rums ready. And uh, yeah, we, we are gonna be moving on now pretty much straight away into um, our um, rum tasting. So yeah, the first one we're gonna do is actually technically not really a rum. Technically not a rum. Technically not a rum. I think, yeah, I, yeah, it is, it is, Bit like uh, when we did the gin tasting a few weeks ago, and we all tried uh, Geneva or Geneva, uh, which is 
technically not a djinn, but it's kind of djinn's origins and it shows kind of the early formations of djinn. This spirit is, it's sort of, it's like a cousin to rum. It, it features a lot of the characteristics of rum, but it is a unique spirit in itself. And that's Kishasa. We have spoke about Kishasa before. We actually did a masterclass on Kishasa. But yeah, so Kishasa is a Brazilian spirit. Um, and essentially it comes from sugarcane juice, as we'll get onto in a second when talking about rums. Most rums are made from molasses, which is the byproduct of when you create sugar, whereas cachaça, it is literally you take pure sugarcane juice, ferment it and distill it. So it's a Brazilian spirit, it's, uh, it's quite, I can't remember how, it's like five, six hundred years old, it's, it's a pretty damn old spirit. It's, it's, now it's one of these spirits as well, so when you go to Brazil, it's, there's, thousands of little micro distilleries all around Brazil, and this is one of the bigger ones. So the one we're going to be tasting is called Belo Barreiro, and uh, it's really famous in Brazil. And it's also quite famous because it's one of the only Brazilian cachachas that do a double distillation. Mm -hmm. So most of them are all single distillations over there, and uh, cachacha is one of these categories. And so grab your glass and uh, pop some of your uh, bottle number one into there. Mm -hmm. And you'll get this, it doesn't Ooh. smell like rum, it's just like, bam, it hits you. And it's just like this aromatics that you get from cachaça. And also it's close cousin, which we're going to taste next, is completely different to any other rum. And this is due to how it's produced and the original source material it's produced from. They're both made from sugar, but they are wildly different apart of the raw material. So Kashasha, what they do is they take sugarcane, which is a grass, it's a massive strand, strand of grass, and uh, almost like bamboo uh, type uh, uh, material, and they take that, they split it, and they crush it into a pulp, and they squeeze all of the juice out of that. So you have this clear sort of syrupy cane juice coming out, full of sugar, unrefined, and full of just hundreds and hundreds of flavour molecules. And that's what comes through with these. So they make it out of that pure juice of cane juice. So when you go into it, I mean, the aroma molecules are just volatile. It just, in a, in a great way, it just, you, you know when you're smelling a cachaça because it just explodes on, it just, for aromas. Uh, they think that I've had it described as it's quite grassy. I've had people describe it's a bit like when you're standing sort of in warm tropical rain, that kind of experience. So this smell when you're smelling cachaça, and the same with agricole, is if you were in a sugar plantation and you had a thunderstorm and it rained down, this is the smell you get. Mm. And uh, it's when rain hits that grass, you, you just, it, you know it instantly. And you know when you are uh, in any area, like in the southern states of America or in the islands, and you go through sugar plantations. I mean, I had it when I was out in Asia and uh, they had a sugar plantation there. And it went through it, and it was tropical rain, and that's the smell, and it's just really weird. You can't, you can, you. It just brings back memories of being in those beautiful hot climates, and anyone who's been to any of those tropical islands will know that smell straight away. And they are, they're, they're, they're only distilled once, so they're a little bit rough around the edges. Uh, they do run their cars on this over in Brazil. Um, <laughs> I'm not even joking, they do. And uh, right. yeah, it's insane. And it is. It's. It's, it's just. It is, it is so, I mean, so this is basically, yeah, so like, um, like with all sort of uh, uh, spirits, the, the sort of, the, the history of it is obviously, essentially, the reason it kind of has that tropical rain story is that they claim that the first time that uh, cachaça was made, that the workers who were not sort of harvesting the sugar cane in the fields would store it all in barrels. And it was so, apparently it was so hot in Brazil that the, it would ferment and actually distill into the air and then the rain would bring it back down and that was how they had the first cachaça. It's a nice story, I don't think it was quite hot enough to distill. As for, as for a lot of these spirit stories, a lot of it is marketing and bullshit. But, yeah, uh, absolutely. It's, but it is lovely, it's lovely tales. It, it does have, and you can see where it comes from because it does have that sort of, yeah. Now this one we've got, there's there's two, there's this one which is the silver and then you, we've got the golden, so it's a little bit more premium, the gold. Um, what they do is they age it in American oak barrels. Uh, they can do it in French oak and they can also do it with indigenous uh, Brazilian woods and they all impart different flavors on it. And uh, it's one of these things that's quite protected in Brazil. So cachaça is one of these things where it has to be made in Brazil. It has to be distilled once. Um, as I said, this one's unusual, it's distilled twice. So as a cachaça, it's a more premium version because that second distillation takes out some of those phenols and esters and some of the compounds in there that can make 
the other one's a little bit ropey and a bit rough and a little bit hard on the palate. So this one has a lovely smooth caramelly texture to it. And it also has this kind of delicious uh, sort of hints of, for me, vanilla from that barrel aging uh, that you don't get from clear cassachas. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's quite a unique flavor on this. And it's, mm. it's beautiful for making drinks. And uh, it's also beautiful for modifying other drinks if you want to give that lovely grassy, funky flavor to it. You really know when that's in any other cocktail. And we use it quite a bit. We use it in our Tai Tai, don't we? So, yeah, yeah, we do buy. use it in the Tai Tai. Yeah, I mean, for me, I get pink licorice all sorts sweets. I don't know why, but that's just yeah. the one I get. Yeah, yeah, yeah you get that, that kind of- in a glass. Yeah. Um, you just get, it, it's, it's, yeah, for me, but you get that sort of, I say sweetness, when I say sweetness, I don't mean it tastes like sugar. It's just, you've got that sweetness because of, of the sort of source material where it comes from. And you can tell that this is fresh sugar cane juice that's been distilled. The fresher or the more earthy the core ingredient that they use for distillation, the more of those sort of characteristics come through in the distillation and it retains some of the sort of, the terroir where it comes from, yeah. you know, you can really yeah, get that for me. And, and the national drink from Brazil is made with this and it's kind of like a daiquiri made with cachaça. Well, it is a daiquiri made mm. with cachaça. It just has loads of ice in it. And so what you do is you take pretty much a whole lime, you chop it into little bits, you pummel it in the bottom of a rocks glass, fill your ice glass with uh, ice and a bit of sugar and uh, literally a teaspoon of sugar, half a three quarters to a whole lime, depending on the size of the lime, muddle it all up and uh, then you fill it with crushed ice and you literally just pour that to the brim. Yeah, like that. quite and, literally uh, to the brim. To the brim, give it a good stir up and uh, yeah, it's that drink. I mean, you, how many do you smoke at last six? Oh, like, oh hundreds, ago. literally yeah. hundreds and hundreds. And, and it is, it's a, it's a something beautifully simplistic about it as a cocktail. It's unapologetic, it's not, it's not pretentious, it's not, it is, it is a little rough around the edges, but that's the beauty of the cocktail. You go to Brazil and, and they'll have paint buckets on the sides of the corner with like blenders where they just throw limes and cachaça and sugar in there, blend it all up, throw it in some cups and go, go for it, enjoy it. It's, it's, it is their natural drink. It's, if you think you sort of end of a working week, most people will go into a, a pub and order a gin and tonic or a pint of Guinness. This is the end of a working week for people in Brazil. This is what they look forward to, which is a caprinha. Breakfast, lunch and dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, carnival season, you probably see millions of uh, uh, Caprinia dispensers up and down the uh, up and down the streets. <laughs> so the next one we're going to move on is actually very very similar, and uh, this is uh, it's people don't know this over here. It's like really unusual. You don't find it in supermarkets. You can find cachaça in supermarkets. This is French rum, and it's French rum extraordinaire, and it's called Agricole, or if you think farmer rum, farmed rum, or uh, that Agricola from the Latin uh, for farmer, and it's like so. This one here is rum agricole, and it's spelled slightly different. It's spelled R H U M, and uh, French like to be a little bit tricky, and uh, they want to do things differently. And so they've essentially done exactly what we've done with cachaça. You've got this lovely spirit that is from pressed sugarcane juice, and this is really key again. And uh, but the thing with uh, this compares it to cachaça is a thing called D O G C, and uh, Depain. Uh, Domain Appellation Controlly. And uh, so you sometimes see this on wines, you see it on cheeses, you see it on all sorts of things. It means that it's a region of the world that is controlled uh, to produce a specific spirit or a specific cheese or food stuff. And it's protected because of it. So when we have this, if you look it up on the bottle here, it will say right at the bottom, Appellation de Origin Control. So an origin appellation controlled. And you find it on wines, so like a Chablis or Champagne, they're all DOCs as well. And so these are all things which are controlled by the French government, and quite rightly so, and it gives a specification of it. And uh, yeah, it's another one of those spirits that is just exceptional, and they come in all different styles as well. Um, but these ones specifically come from French islands. So you think Brazil first and foremost, and we'll get on to other styles. So this is what we call a French style. Yeah, rum. French style rum. Yeah, it's it's straight away you can you can see the the, the similarities I think for me to cachaça, but it's softer, softer, way 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 softer. It, it's not as much of a punch in the face as it's just this sort of beautiful soft sort of yeah aromas coming through. So the first ones cachaças are quite often in uh, pot stilled, so they come yeah. out they're forty eight between thirty eight and forty eight percent alcohol. And uh, they're in these big copper pot stills, and that gives so much of the flavour molecules come across with it 
because it's a lower distillation uh, temperature. And so it still brings a lot, a lot of the raw material. And usually with that first single distillation, it's, it's very, it brings across all of those big esters and phenols and stuff like that, that I said earlier. And uh, whilst this one here, they do in column distillation. So it's in big column distillation, a bit like gin. And so yeah. you get a much higher percentage of ethanol alcohol coming off. And this means that a lot of those big flavor bombs are left behind but it also is cleaner and more subtle and more delicate and but you still get that grassy note yeah yeah earthy and floor but more floral it's more way delicate. more floral yeah way 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 more floral and then when you go into taste it's like boom yeah but it just goes to show that mm. in theory same process but take it to a different part of the world you know, unique to this island and um, with the Appalachian troll on it and the way and just using that column distillation just go for a higher a higher sort of first distill completely changes, you know, the, the outcome of it. You still see the, the sort of origins of where it comes from, but then it's just yeah. It's it's subtler, it's cleaner, it's fresher. And uh, you add this, you add two two parts of a nice white rum to one part of this in a daiquiri, and it just gives extra little floral notes into it and grassier notes that just really open up with it and um, they make an incredible drink now yeah again these are agricoles they are particular for french islands so uh, mauritius guadalupe but most importantly martinique and mm. to be classed as a doc um they have to be from martinique so this one clement is a blank uh white uh unaged completely so this is pretty much out of the still and then brought back to 40 uh, percent alcohol um and it's just it's much cleaner uh they do have other ones which are aged as well um clement's one of these my favorite brands when it comes to uh agricoles as well and it's like it's 20 something quid a bottle uh yeah. that's where it starts at and that's about as affordable as uh agricoles go up to 60 70 80 100 quid a bottle but yeah. most of them are around 40 quid um and uh yeah i mean this is the unaged unadulterated it's a pure iteration of what an ag agriculture should be. And uh, yeah, it's to me, absolutely delicious. I hope you like this, by the way. Yeah, it's As delicious. Some people will be tasting these going, what the fuck, Paddy, Jake, what are you giving us? <laughs> um, a bit like, a bit like when, you try, when you try scotches, you know, there are those gonna be those scotches. Like for example, if I was gonna introduce someone to something they've never tried before, I'm not gonna give them a, like a heavy peated, uh, like single malt scotch, the same way that Agricole is sometimes the nicer way of introducing people into sugarcane spirits because, like I said, it is lighter. It's going to have a little bit more floralness to it as well, and then you can hit them with something a bit heavier. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, what, what is it that makes these? Is as going back on this, it's like they, they have similarities to that cachacha. It's grassy, it's earthy, it's floral, but it doesn't have the. It's more refined than that cachacha. If you've got some of your cachacha, go back to it now, and your your palate would have opened a bit more, and you'll get more out of it. But you'll realise there's rougher notes around it, and it's but the cachacha was aged as well. So you get more vanillas, yeah. chocolatey notes and things like that in it. Barrel which are flavor. The barrel aging, which gives it that. Same as in whiskies and in rums, uh, the more uh, intense rums later on. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the main thing. And uh, yeah, as we said, these are made in the Caribbean islands. And so Caribbean rum is quite big and vast because all these islands are different. And, uh, mm. and they have different processes as well. And it's like, there are different agricole rum styles as well. So you have like a rum blanc, you have rum martinique, uh, which is an élevé sous boy, and then you have the vieux, uh, which is an extra aged version of it as well. So just as in all rums, they have different levels of aging and all the rest of it. And we'll get onto that a little bit time. And so the next one we're going to go on to is what we. So that was our French style of rum. We've had Brazilian, which is kind of the other. Um, but now we're going to go on to Spanish style rum, which is just. You know, this is sort um, of the, take the, the, the Havana Club. Yeah, this is the third the third bottle, guys. So this is kind of this is where we arrive at rum. This is what m majority of the world think of when they think of, of rum, which is Spanish style or Cuban style rum. So the biggest rum brands in the world yeah. are generally Spanish. So you're talking Bacardi, big famous, Puerto Rico, and used to be in Cuba. 
Um, all of these distilleries used to be Bacardi, they're now Havana Club. But Thanks to Castro, wasn't it? Yeah, Fidel Castro <laughs> took it over there. You, you can't buy this in America, by the way. It's Ooh. not Yeah, they can't buy it. It's, uh, so whenever they do a uh, kind of classification of the best rums for a daiquiri in the world, this is always excluded because most of those, most of those competitions are done in America and it was, they can't put it in because they can't taste it. And uh, it would win every time. Uh, but yeah, they do a blank version of this, which they kind of did in the 1970s to 1990s, which is awesome. For oh, the Blanco, people. yeah, you yeah. can't get it anymore. Yeah. I think I've, I've got a, a bottle, a dusty bottle somewhere that I can't touch anymore because they don't make it anymore. So yeah, this is, uh, this is the quintessential rum for a daiquiri yeah. or for a mojito. Both yeah. Cuban drinks, you've got to use a Cuban rum. And uh, when you taste this, It is completely different to what we just tasted, those first two. And uh, this is down to several things. First of all, it's that raw product. So all of these countries in the Caribbean and in the southern states of America used to produce sugar. And they start with sugar cane, which is where the first two came from. But then what they do is they then boil that up and they refine it and they filter it and they get this lovely white sugar that we have, this refined sugar that Tate and Lyle and all these other sugar producers colonise the world with. And there is a bad history about it as well. Yeah. I'm not going to get into that because it's our birthday. And <laughs> yeah, we don't want to. Um, <laughs> so we are going to stick to the nice stuff, which is rum. What's come out of this uh, bad history? And so what used to be left over when they made this sugar and all this crystallised sugar that they would send back was this big, thick, thick treacly molasses still had loads of sugar in there and it was that molasses dark treacle that they would then put yeast in add water ferment it and then it would make a, this treacly beer and then what they would do is they then distill that and that is what most rums as you know it are made out of. and it's that byproduct of sugar production and uh yeah, yeah. it gives a completely different flavor as you oh, can see completely different yeah it's it's it was still flavour, but like like I was saying before, with the whole because this is born out of something that has already had sort of work done on it. It, it it's it's whereas you think of these sort of agricultural cachaças are quite fresh and grassy. This one has it has some deep richness to it because you can see where it's come from. It's come from molasses, which is going to have that, but it's still really clean. Uh, you've got that sort of citrus, vanilla, as it is an aged rum. It's still it's seen at the inside of a barrel for for. Three years. Uh, three years, yeah. essentially, yeah, three years. So the other thing they've done with this is that they charcoal filter it. Filter it. So when we, we've heard of charcoal filtering before when you talk about vodka, and vodka, what they do is they charcoal filter vodka. So things like Smirnoff is charcoal filtered 10 times. Mm. And this strips out every flavor molecule that you can possibly imagine in it. And uh, But they've only done it once. So they charcoal filter it, and it takes a bit of the color out, so that's why it's quite light and fresh and mm. zingy. But it still retains quite a bit of flavor in there. But this is quite particular to these Spanish style rums, is charcoal filtration. And what it does is it takes all the rougher uh, elements out of those rougher flavor compounds out and leaves the really sweet and elegant ones. And so when they barrel age it, you have all these vanillins and tannins and, uh, and soft flavoring that comes in, caramelization that comes in, and these all remain. And, but Spanish style rums, uh, when they're unaged, uh, or slight aging, they uh, deliver a quick sharp hit to the palate and then it's gone. Yes, it's kind of evaporates. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and, and especially uh, when you look at the age statement of three years, when we think about some of the things that we try, especially in scotches and things like that, you see 12, 15, 21. Three doesn't seem like quite a lot and you almost go, well, how, how much can three years do? But whereas everything in the Caribbean is different because of climate, because of weather. So whereas Something like some of the scotches that we talk about, they get aged for 12 years in Scotland. Scotland's quite cold and it's not particularly tropical in its climate. Whereas you go to the Caribbean, especially when we're talking about fermenting things and things like that, heat does change things. So three years makes a hell of a difference to these spirits in the Caribbean because of the, because of the climate and the way it works out there. Yeah, I mean, the heat caps as a massive catalyst for mm. uh, chemical reaction, which is what's going on in those barrels. And what happens is you have this cyclic thing in the barrel of the liquid moving round and round and touching the surface of the barrel, taking all the flavours of it. 
And that's if you think about if you put heat under something, you see that lovely movement happening automatically. That's what's happening in a barrel when it, when it goes on. So when you go to Scotland or you go to uh, the calves uh, of Cognac, where they keep them at 12 degrees all the time, it's, it's a slow, slow elephant process. That's why sometimes only 10, 15, 20, 30 years. In run terms, that's just the lifetime. And yeah. uh, the caramelization that happens in those barrels is just insanely quick. And, uh, and so, yeah, this one here, it's three years, it's elegant, it's light, it pops on a pellet. It is without a doubt for me, one of the best bang for buck light rums in the world. We use it in cocktails all the time. And if you're making a daiquiri, it's almost second to none. Yeah. Almost. Almost. <laughs> uh, the only reason I say almost is that bad boy from Plantation is for me, the best rum in the world for a daiquiri. Uh, and that's number two. That's double the money. So <laughs> yeah. Where do I lean towards? That one. Because I can drink more. Ah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, um, Plantation, they don't do anything wrong, to be honest. We just had uh, Paul McFadden on with all our staff and we did a Zoom chat with him literally about a week and a bit ago. And it was amazing fun. We had all these great uh, rums sent down the Isle of Fiji. We had some uh, Jamaican. Jamaican. <laughs> we had oh, so, so much fun. So, much fun. so we did an online mask cast, a bit like we're doing now, but uh, just with their rums. And we're going to be trying one of their best uh, yeah. in a minute as well. Um, but before we get to that one, we're going to go on to our next style of rum. Uh, so we've done French, we've done the Brazilian, we've done Spanish. So now something a little bit more closer to home. We're going for an English style of rum. And so when we're doing English styles of rum, uh, I'm just looking at a traffic warden out by my car. But, <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> um, keeping an eye on him. <laughs> Um, anyhow, he's, uh, so I can carry on. I don't have to run off and go. Um, so yeah, so yeah, we're going to do our next one, which is English. Um, for this, we're using one of the quintessential brands in the world, Gosling's Black Seal from Bermuda. Yeah, okay. Gosling Seal. Yeah. So uh, like, like we said, so we've gone through the different styles of rum. We've had we've had Spanish. We've had. Uh, Brazilian, we've had French, and then obviously we were over there as well. We had our plantation, and so we started creating uh, rums. But and so we made uh, this one, Gosling. So Gosling's, it's it is a it is an aged rum, uh, but it's this is I like talking about this one because this is where we get into the category of when people describe things as dark rums or or, or yeah, that quite literally that dark rum because uh, it is a pot distilled and column distilled rum. But um, I mean straight away I'm getting. Spice, I'm getting it's way more molassesy for me. Yeah, it's treacle, treacle, so, way and, more treacle. I mean, you think about treacle tar when you make that, you make it with that big, thick treacle, golden syrup, and treacle and stuff like that. That's that smell. But the thing people don't realize is rum, rum is a is a wide category, and we have so many different styles. And we're like you said, we are literally scratching the surface. You go to any major rum bar in the UK, and they have hundreds of different styles from all around the world that you can try. But the thing is, there's no real strict class, uh, classification as to what rum is or what you do when you produce yeah. rum. So there's lots of different things that can happen to it. And so a lot of things that producers will do after they've uh, distilled rum is that they will add caramel to it. They'll literally add caramel colouring into it to create a, uh, to give it a darker colour. Especially after you've done something like a charcoal filtering to remove some of the the uh, the harshness that you don't want in the flavour. They sometimes want to get that colour back into it. So they're allowed to add a little bit of caramel colouring into it just to give it that darkness. And that's sort of what you see on some of these brands as well. There's that illusion of, of ageness. You see something really dark and really rich. You think, oh, well, that's a 20 year whiskey. Yeah, sort it's of been color. in a barrel forever. Yeah. You know, so, but it has, it's just that caramel adding to it. And it doesn't really massive amounts of flavor. That's all no. comes from the aging. But what you find with this one particularly is like, I mean, Gosling's has kind of stewed fruit. It has fruit cake. It's kind of PX, like a PX sherry almost in there. So it's almost stewed and stuff. But there's lots of spice as well. And it's like, and this basically comes from them having uh, this fantastic production method. And so when we look at English style rums, they can be pot stilled and columns distilled. So quite mm. often they use both. So they'll start with a pot distillation, and then they'll go into column distillation. And this happens in whiskey as well a lot. And so these traditions went over to the Caribbean when the Brits went over there, and they started uh, nicking everything. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, so when we look at these uh, styles of rum, you're looking at Jamaica, Barbados, Bermuda, 
St. Lucia, what a great island. Uh, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago. I mean, we always want to cheer for them in the Olympics because they're cool. Uh, Trinidad, a friend of mine, always calls them because that's where he's from. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's kind of cool. And they've got this lovely molasses again that they're yeah. made from. And they're rich, treacle drinks. And this particular rum, it does one of only five spirits in the world. And it has a trademark on a cocktail. Yeah. And uh, so to call a dark and stormy drink on a drinks list anywhere in the world, uh, the dark and stormy cocktail, which is ginger beer, lime and Gosling's black seal. It's a trademarked cocktail, one of the only ones in the world. And, uh, and it's really, really unusual to see that. And they've done it. And I'm kind of in two minds about it. I think they're a bit idiots for trademarking a cocktail when we all make it and we can make it with a dark rum. But they want it specifically made with their black It's seal. one of those, yeah. Yeah, like we said with the stories of drinks, it's that classic, you know, sort of marketing campaign where they can kind of go, even to the point where I think you can get Gosling's ginger beer as well. Yeah. 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 It's, it, yeah. yeah. But it's a bit of a dick move because <laughs> uh, um, bartenders don't like being told what they can and can't do. And it's like, really? Come on, get over yourselves. Uh, so next time, you, a, next time you're, in a, you're in a bar and you... You order a, a dark rum cocktail with ginger beer and lime, and you're wondering why is it called the darkest storm or perfect storm or very close to dark or the stormy and dark. That's why. Yeah, and, um, yeah it is exactly why. I know it is. It's a dick move, but it's like it's still a great product. But uh, and it is. If you're talking about English rums, it's very easy to talk about that as well. And it's like when other ones I start look, looking at are uh, things like. El Dorado. El Dorado. Yeah, I mean, one of my favourites, I think. In best rum. It is. It is. Well, if you're going to get something that age statement, like if, if you if you're in the market of having something like a 12 year old whiskey or 15 year old whiskey, I would. This is the sort of air category you could go into. They're Guinness rums. They're from Demer. They're Demerara rums, and they're just. It's it's like cacao butter. <laughs> it is it's gorgeous. Just, About 40 quid a bottle. Um, <laughs> it's a 15 year old rum, 40 quid a bottle. So give you put that in context. Havana Club 15, again, for me, it's an insane rum. And it's, but it's like 130, 140 quid a bottle. Um, but if you want the bang for buck, El Dorado 15, wow, what a, what a product. Um, but yeah, 40, 45 quid a bottle. So uh, if you're looking off things to tick off, you have something. So when we were saying earlier about uh, how rums have different styles and whatnot and things like that, I mean, we've got rums that taste just like single malt whiskey, but uh, uh, Havana Club 15 year old tastes like a super aged cognac. So, if you have Louis yeah. Trez, which is like, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds a bottle, and you have that next to, blind taste that next to Havana Club 15 year old, it's really hard to tell apart. And they've fooled cognac tasters in the past using that exact rum. So, yeah, I mean, you can kind of get the bang for buck with that instead of paying seven, eight, nine hundred pounds a bottle for a cognac, <laughs> you can pay 150 quid for a, an aged rum. and all the flavours there. It's got aged so much yeah. that it started to lose the characteristics of that original base spirit. So yeah, so that was our fourth run uh, of the day and we're moving on to one of my home favourite runs at the moment and I drink this stuff at home a lot and uh, in lockdown especially <laughs> it's been my go-to and um, this is from that distillery we talked about uh, from Maison Ferrand, and it is plantation rum. So we just talked about it again. We talked about a few of them, the, that plantation pineapple, the three star, the original dark, these bottles up here. Every rum they do is insane, insanely good. And these are yeah. people who love rum and they they, 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 For me, what I see from plantation, their job is they, they highlight the world of rum, where rum comes from. They don't just stick to one specific style. They highlight everything. They show you what is out there in the world of rum. So yeah, so right now we're in, we've now gone to Barbados. Yeah. And so <laughs> again with this, it's like, it's, you're gonna love this rum. Anyone who doesn't like this rum, neat is something wrong with them. It's like an old fashioned cocktail in a glass, neat, and it's just- Old fashioned, but do you know what? And I get, mm. I get that vanilla that you're, you're gonna get a lot of aged rums, but for me, I get like coconut, I get a lot of coconut on this one. Um, it's just, and it's 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 a sipper. It's a neat sipper for me. So I buy a bottle of this pretty much. I don't know, once every two weeks, and uh, get for it. <laughs> get the, yeah, yeah, it's just so easy to drink. And once you taste those other ones, you now see where aging really comes in. So this is an aged rum, and uh, it's only five years. Yet the amount of 
sort of it's almost Werther's original toffee and it's yeah. that you see what I mean yeah it's, 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 it is yeah and like, like the English though it's, it's pot still and column again so you've got that sort of the pot still is going to help retain some of that characteristic of the of the rum where it comes from the column's going to give it that lovely clean it's just it is it is a powerhouse so um, if you want to buy this bottle you get it from Asda it's 28 quid a bottle yeah and it's the same online but for the money bang for buck literally nothing beats it it's 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 a neat drinking rum. It works exceptionally well in cocktails as well. But for me, I just drink. I don't even drink it on ice. I just drink it neat because ice you lose a bit. It chills it a bit too much. You lose that mm. caramelisation that you have with this. And uh, it is a bonkersly good uh, spirit. And I don't know. I just like you get a little bit of cinnamon, dried coke, lots of dried coconut. There's vanilla there. A little bit of banana. It's that back palate, right? Yeah. yeah. When it's sort of just, just, just that sort of creamy banana-y sort of, yeah, yeah, almost, yeah. yeah. Stewed banana, stewed banana, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's like, yeah. This is this is shows you how good aged rum can get. And this again, this is made from molasses, like the other two, and uh, but it's just it's it's bonkersly good. And you can go up to like 17, 21 year old rums. Um, I mean, you can get rums that just taste like anything, and. Uh, this to me is for 28 quid. Yes. Come on. It's <laughs> you, you, cheaper you. than most of the gins, the crappy gins that people buy nowadays. Yeah, yeah this is absolutely bonkers, exceptional. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, is, it is one of the best out there. I think actually, yeah, uh, yeah it, was so, it was so good that I instantly changed the spec of our rum old fashioned with Dr. Inks to use that. Yeah. Because <laughs> immediately I was like, no, that's what I need to use. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I early days of lockdown, I got a bottle of this, and I, I think when I was I just, like I did the same. deep in the hole with it and going, oh, what the fuck is going yeah. on with the world? And uh, I necked a bottle in the night, not even realised. I wake up in the morning, I went, D, did you nick the rum? She was like, no, you drank the lot. I was like, oh, that's why I feel so good. Yeah, I think I did the same thing. I had a Zoom meeting with friends, and it was one of those ones where you sat down and you enjoy yourself. Suddenly you go, Oh, the bottle's gone. And you go, Oh, I can't stand up. <laughs> Actually, I heard about this. I, in the flat he was in, his girlfriend at the time, basically, he fell over. <laughs> he just went, Dunk. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. It, it, made, it made the Zoom meetings more bearable. <laughs> but it is bang, bang for your buck. It is, it is always going to be one of my go tos. It's always, solid. Always. Yeah, it's so solid. And, um, Anything by Plantation is really good. Go online, buy the whole range. They do a tasting pack actually as well. Uh, really good. They do, yeah, and they just have yeah. so much stuff, and they're always releasing new blends, new stuff. It, it just, they, yeah, they are really pushing the boundaries of. of and it, like I said before, it's great because they just, they don't just highlight a, an island or one specific category. They, they show what rum is. They show the the wide variety that is available out there. And again, they even produce some pretty wicked tiki mugs as yeah. well for your cocktails. So you can kind of see on the bottom of Plantation. Uh, with their logos as well, and yeah, they're quite sexy. So they're cool. Uh, they're they're real, 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 really, really cool guys. Yeah. And yeah, we have those in uh, Hululu, and everyone makes them. We've got one left. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, now we're going to move on to um, the uh, the bad boy of rum. Mm. It's the naughty one. It's the uh, we bartenders. <laughs> we love this spirit, and in Jamaica, where it comes from. 90% of all rum in Jamaica is this, and 90% of every drink drunk is this spirit. And uh, if you're Jamaican, it's the heart of Jamaica. It's what makes the people. Um, if there was any spirit in the world that was the soul of a nation, and the soul of party, and music, and everything, this encapsulates all of it. It's the most passionate spirit in the world. And over here, we treat it with a little bit of fear and respect. But in Jamaica, it is only one thing. It's Ray. <laughs> it's Ray. And it's mad. So, what's it saying, Tim? Uh, it's got a naff bottle. Look at it. It looks, it's got the colours of Jamaica. But it's also, it's the black, it's the green, it's the yellow. But it's 63% alcohol. Um, it's naughty. And uh, we're going to do that next. So, uh, this is, this is, yeah, uh, whenever you've been in a bar and your bar, you've gone up and your mate's gone up and gone, can I get something that's going to screw my friend over? <laughs> You're usually getting handed a shot of Ray and Matthew. But 
it's for me this is almost we talk about like cylindrical uh, cylindrical things this is almost going full circle for me for, because this there's a terminology used in the world of rum and it's always used to describe Jamaican rums and that's funk and this is funky it is like with the cachaça at the start the aroma compounds are just this is why they, they smoke so much fucking weed in Jamaica, because uh, they need to come down in the morning. And it's like, you drink this stuff at night, and it's going to screw you up. And so you need someone to go, oh, what's happened to my head? And uh, yeah, <laughs> nice big bud. But it um, is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it is insane. And it's, so I would say at this point, if anyone is, you can add water to this one if you want to. Because uh, it is 63%, and if you're not used to trying, you'll get an alcohol burn. You'll get, you're going to get an alcohol burn. So, straight away, you've got that hit of alcohol. And I've left this one to last for a very, very good reason. We wanted to hit you strong and hard so you've got your palate adapted to drinking rum neat. We then come in with the lighter, softer Caribbean style uh, Spanish rums. We then work our way up through those British styles and then into those aged. Now, when you taste this rum, because you've had a lot of others, uh, you will really, your palate's opened up. It's had the alcohol burn, so it doesn't hit you quite. If we went with this one, Sam, mm -hmm. you'd have been, oh my God. <laughs> Game over. Down. But now you can taste it. You can taste those subtle notes. And there's big things of demer demerara sugar, banana, a little bit of spice, and also a tiny bit of oak in that as mm. well. It's refined. But when you hit this straight in, if we went in from the get-go of this, it would rip you apart. And uh, we didn't want to do that to you. And uh, we thought we'll wait to the end. <laughs> um, but this has to be, for me, I put this in cocktails all day long, all the time. But I put in 5 mil, 10 mil in a 50 mil measure of the rum spirit blend because you just want a hint of it. And we've got a drink coming up in a second, actually, which does have quite a few of these rums in, but it does have a hint of that in as well. And it's there, as Jake said, to give what we call funk. Yeah. And when you smell it. So, the, yeah, it's it comes from... So Jamaican rums are notorious for... So when we talk about spirit production, there's always the stage of fermentation. Now, most fermentation, a few days, is, is typical for, for most spirits, and especially with most rums, whereas uh, Jamaican rum, they can go up to 30 days of fermenting. Uh, and the longer that ferments, the more complex flavours get brought out. They've got these big, big fermentation pits out in Jamaica where they, they, they have all sorts of stuff in them that are fermenting. And they add fruit and things like that and it just to add sugars and, and create more fermentation and it creates this funk. It adds such a complexity of flavour. And I think um, some Jamaican ones are sort of categorised on how long they've, they've spent fermenting and you're, you're sort of 30 days plus run. These are just, toxic wow. pits. Yeah. They are, literally, and it's like, and they're literally pits dug in the ground, and they just chuck everything in there, and they sh let it stew. So they're chucking pineapples in there, they're chucking banana, fruit, banana, all sorts. they're chucking leaves, they're chucking uh, different bits of the fruits and stuff like Anything that. Anything they can use to feed the yeast yeah. and, and yeah. keep that fermentation going and produce more and more esters and things like that. And this yeah. is what gives all of this flavour, all of this complexity to this one, and it's what makes Jamaican rum such a unique category yeah. within this. And then what they do is they put some of that in the still, and it's these nuts yeasts, and they put it in the still, and it works with the sugar, and it ferments off, and they distill it off, and they capture some of these flavours. And yeah, it's funk, and uh, it's the soul of a nation. It's Jamaica, and it's uh, it's absolutely bloody exceptional. And it's like, for me, always in a bar, no matter what bar I have, I always have a bottle of Ray, because it always comes in as that little thing to add in that je ne sais quoi into a cocktail, whereas people look at it and they go, oh, there's something about this cocktail, especially with rum cocktails, mm -hmm. and they go, I don't know what it is, but there's a layer of flavour there that's coming from somewhere. And it's always the way. Yeah, always. I yeah, it's it's delicious. It's absolutely delicious. And yeah, it's sixty three percent. It's a bit oof, but oh, it's just so good. Only twenty five quid a bottle. Yeah. So for sixty three percent, not bad. Yeah, and they've been around a while. Ray, Ray and nephew are one of the original brands. In fact, Ray and nephew uh, were notorious because uh, uh, at the moment we've got the the Tai Tai available, which is one of our sort of ready to drink cocktails, and based on the Mai Tai. And Ray and Nephew uh, was the original rum in the original Mai Tai. They used yeah. a Ray and Nephew 17 year. Yeah. Uh, and it was so popular, they wiped out Ray and Nephew stocks of it. You can't get it, it's gone. I think yeah. there was a few bottles a few years ago that went for crazy money. I think there was a there was a hotel in uh, uh, Belfast, the merchant, that 
got their hands on a bottle of Ray in their 317 year, and I think they had the thousand dollar Mai Tai, something like that. Yeah, was... they did. It was um, so the guy who had world's best bar. So uh, the merchant was the world's best bar years ago, and uh, I've got very contention with them because um, <laughs> I, I, did this, I, brought it up. I, I did this bloody bar called Bureau about I don't know uh, almost 14 years ago now, and um, we were up for the UK's best drinks list. And um, we didn't even have a drinks list, but we were up for it. We were nominated for it. And the bar that beat me was the merchant. And uh, the guy who had that, he, um, uh, Sean Muldoon, he went on to set up Dead Rabbit's Grocery and Grog in New York. And uh, they won World's Best Drinks List, I don't know, one, two, three times? Or something, something like, like three, three, times. They, three they, times. They they kind of appeared on the scene and then just wiped everyone else off the scene for a while. I'm not bitter about it at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, but they they got their hands on Ray and Nephew 17, and I'm just, it's, and so they were able to do like the thousand dollar my type because once it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. That's it, and it's 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 the rarest of rarest spirits, and the way we re recreate that spirit now by blending aged drums and different styles, Indeed. three four different styles of drums, just that. to try and capture that original my type. Yeah. So go online, buy our Thai Thai, which is a kind of riff on it, which has got all these Thai herbs in it, like lemongrass and. Uh, lime leaf and stuff like that, and uh, it's but like quite with any, it's disco. But with any good tiki cocktail, you start with that lovely blend of rums because, like I said, the star guys, rums just lend themselves to each other. They love to be mixed, and you can create these unique flavors when you're taking something like quite a light Cuban style, and like I said, just adding in that sort of five mil of ray just gives it something else. It gives it that complexity, and you've got this whole new style, which is kind of a perfect lead on to our next cocktail. So, next cocktail we're doing is a riff on a cocktail. It's called. Murder Ball. Um, now, Murder Ball is a movie from the 1980s. <laughs> it's uh, go on, Google it. Um, <laughs> it's it's on roller skates. It's the 1980s, and they're throwing around these lethal metal balls and killing each other on roller skates. <laughs> and uh, I think Michael Ironside was in it. Yeah, yeah, it's and, one of those um, classic 80s movies. A, a friend of mine always best described them. Kind of a real take your brain out and just enjoy the ride. <laughs> Stop running skates. Um, so yeah, it's super cool. And um, so yeah, we wanted to do a highball cocktail because highballs are kind of cool and in fashion. It's a glass, it's called a highball glass, but this has been made funky as by lovely guys at Libby Glass. So as you can see, it's got a zombie hula girl on it. <laughs> and it's got all of these sort of zombie heads on it as well. So, <laughs> I love this glass. It's so naff, but cool. And um, yeah, it's kind of in fashion again now. This is... Uh, 1980s styling and 80s is in and so everything we look at at the moment whether it's Wonder Woman 1984 or uh, Thor Ragnarok, yeah, Stranger people, Things. People want that kind of, uh, it, when we talk about Tiki, Tiki was born out of escapism, mm. people wanted yeah. to not be, look at the grey dreary rust, especially right now, right now you know, uh, understandably you know, it's been one of those, so people want some fun colour, some light. And I think, and especially in the bartending world, we have this attitude for quite a long time towards disco of, of oh, it's rubbish, or it's artificial, or all the drinks are, are poorly made and they're just sugar. And, and whilst, they work. And they work. But but there was but a there was a, there was a a sort of I, I was I literally the other day. Oh, I, yeah, um, uh, you can if anyone that's got Disney Plus, Cocktail is on there, the Tom Cruise movie, <laughs> and I rewatched it. And I watched it going back, going, yeah, the drinks are rubbish, but they. There is a charm to it, and, and, and so, so this isn't an old movie. I'm, I'm, like, what the fuck? It's like this is what got me into bartending. Yeah, like this. That's how old I am. It's like I still want that bar in Barbados on the beachfront where he where he goes to and goes close, and hides out. Close enough. <laughs> Not that. Timothy, uh, Timothy yeah. Barbados. So this, is, this is where this all comes from. It's like uh, this love of tiki, and it's like. Yeah. Uh, but the attitude yeah. now, bartenders, they're coming back to it and going, well, look, rather than just doing that attitude of going, the drinks are rubbish look at what was what made those drinks great the escapism the fun and that, i think now more than ever people want fun drinks they want that kind of laid back relaxed don't take yourself too seriously uh, attitude towards their cocktails and that's what we like to do with ours as well we sort of you know we like to experiment we mess around we do fun stuff but we also like to make sure that the drink is tasty and it's fun and you guys can enjoy it as much as us there has been too much over the last 10 years in bartending there's been too much wank and a lot of seriousness with drinks and yeah i'm i'm First to admit, I've been down that road, and uh, but at the same time, it's like you come out the other end and you want that play, especially coming out the back end of a pandemic. Um, when you look at tiki as it, where it arrived from, it was in the 1930s. So they had had the pandemic, they had Spanish flu, they had a world war, they had the Great Depression. 
It's it's similar times. It's I mean, 100 years later. It's similar times. So everything needs to come. This is why uh, we do a corporate masterclass. It's all about tropical escapism. That's why mm -hmm. we have a tiki bar. And uh, it's all about fun. And even, like, even back then, you know, the chap that sort of one of the key figures that brought it forward, uh, Don the Beach, whose who's, uh, drink we're going to be sort of use the inspiration for, he, rum was, was cheap, it was nasty. It was the stuff that, yeah. the only reason that he had so much of it was because of prohibition. He basically imported a load of it illegally. Yeah. And uh, people didn't like it. So he went, cool, well, my margins have got to be tight. I'll use rum. And now we now we've got all these categories of rum that all of this stuff is born out of the fact that some guys basically just turn around and went, well, it's the cheapest thing I can get my hands on, let's do it. But he made good drinks of it. Just because you've got a what is considered a cheap spirit, just because you've got something that isn't a hundred pounds or you haven't got the highest tech bit of kit doesn't mean you can't make a good drink. And only in America would they have a fucking world war, depression, <laughs> uh, pandemic, and then they'll go, We're gonna not let you drink alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you imagine if that happened in the UK, I mean, Boris would be beheaded. Um, it would literally be that. that... <laughs> Not complaining. Um, uh, but anyhow, uh, yeah, it would be that bad. And uh, so 10 years go past, you get to the 1930s, they last, your last drink booze again, and tiki arrives. And this is one of the gods of tiki. Uh, that sort of daiquiri is kind of one of those earlier versions of it. They were like the 1920s and whatnot. Yeah. This is... Boom! It's it's a drink that is uh, when it first came out, they were only allowed to serve two to people at a time because they had like six units of alcohol in. Yeah. Fuck you up! And uh, we want to do that too. You talk Ray and nephew. They had they had over. But actually, the yeah. the run they used in it was actually even stronger than the Ray and nephew. I think it was yeah, close to seventy five. Seventy five percent originally. <laughs> it was uh, a little bit naughty. And then um, so yeah. So the first thing we're going to do with this is we're going to take some Havana Club. Well, in your one, we've got some special. I'm going to use a little bit of three-year-old in mine, and I am literally just going to build this in the glass. So I don't need to shake it. And uh, you've got your pouch number one, so you just pop that in your glass, and uh, you're away. So, Jake, do you want to? Actually, I've got probably a hybrid behind it. Uh, yeah, just use the pouch. Uh, that'll do. Yeah. Okay. I'll have a pouch, yeah, so, so it's and easy to disguise. Yeah, but this is this is one of my favourite zombie co uh, uh, tiki cocktails. Uh, obviously we've taken it, and, th and this is the beauty of tiki cocktails, is that it's all about layering and building flavour and creating your own stuff, and it's, and it's, I mean I think this drink was originally inspired by, there was a punch that existed hundreds of years ago, sort of around the sort of 1800s, 1700s, called the Planter's yeah, Punch. Um, um, yeah, 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 the Planter's Punch, and it was this simple format of just taking spirits, sweetener, um, citrus, and, and lengthener in the form of tea. And, and that was it, it was a simple drink and then they just took that format and what Don was great at doing was going, well cool, if I'm gonna, my spirit, or my strength, I'm gonna go, not just one rum, I'm gonna go, let's do some Jamaican rum, let's yes. do some Barbadian rum, let's do some Trinidadian rum, let's mix all of them together. The sweetener, oh I'm not just gonna do uh, sugar, I'm gonna do, let's do some cinnamon in there, let's throw some vanilla in there, let's throw all these sorts of different flavors in there. Just layers and layers and layers and layers. Even the flavor. citrus, he yeah. would find alternative, he'd go, well, I'm not just gonna use lime, let's use lime and grapefruit, let's use lime, lemon and grapefruit, let's throw everything in there that we can. And creating all of these complex layers to the point where you drink something and you kind of go, I don't know what's in there, but it tastes amazing. But it's just, it's bonkers. It's like what we call in the bar industry a flavour bomb. Yeah. And, uh, and a well made so, zombie has that, yeah. Yeah, so the first thing, the base spirit, which is 25 mil, is Havana Club Especial. Then we are taking, as I spoke to you a, bit, a little bit about this, Plantation Original Dark. So this is what they macerate all the fruit of, uh, fruit in for to make that plantation pineapple. So it's one of those spirits. And so I'm just going to put 15 millilitres of that in. And then the last spirit I'm going to have, a bit of ray, um, and 10 ml of that. And you don't want to overload your ray because it just dominates otherwise. Yeah. So what we're doing here is we've got a light, soft base of rum, which is that Spanish style rum. We're then putting in almost an English style rum with that aged rum, that dark rum. So if you think about that and that. So we've got those together. And now what we're adding, so we've got that molasses, we've got that spice, caramel, then we've got the sharp sorts, uh, short sharp snack of the Spanish rum. And then we're putting in a bit of Jamaican funk. So uh, that's the last bit we're adding into it. And so those are my three different rums. And so as Jake was saying, with tiki, with layers of rums, we put that in. 
So then you put in layers of sweetener and then you put in layers of um, uh, acidity as well. Yeah. So the, the last thing we've got in here, which is a lovely little bowl, which is this, which is, you've seen this before when I did my Hendrix, uh, my Absinthe Masterclass, and I've used it in a lot of cocktails. And for this, we are literally using a couple of drops. Yeah. I don't want to overpower it because the, abs uh, the anise in it will just take over. So we don't want to overpower it, but a little bit of Hendrix absinthe in there. It's like, again, it's all those naughty, naughty flavours. It just gives that sort of lovely, yeah. like we, like when I went back to you before, like I said, when I try cachaca, I get that almost licorice all sorts, sorts of flavours. So it's like with that, it's just giving it this lovely anise aroma around the edge of the cocktail, just lifting it up a bit more. Well, this is it. And yeah. um, so lastly, what I'm going to do is I've got some acid adjusted uh, falernum. I've got some passion fruit and I've got a pomegranate and pineapple. And so that's in here as well. So I'm just gonna pop that in. Even Falernum itself. So Falernum is uh, from Barbados originally. It was a, it's it's a syrup, but born of taking sugar syrup and then you're adding in limes, cloves, cinnamon, all these different spices they had available. They pretty much walked down to the spice market, just take a big old handful of everything and throw it into this syrup. And it, and it just creates this complexity. So rather than just using a bog standard sugar syrup, using something like Falernum just lifts all these flavors up and just creates huge flavors in, in the glass. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, and Falernum's one of those great things. You can have, there's a velvet Falernum, which is an alcoholic version of the syrup, mm. but also, but this version was one of those things that they put into it and it's like your whole spice cabinet going in. Instead of putting bitters in, they would quite often put Falernum in and uh, it would have all spice and all sorts in it. So you should have a little can of soda water in your, uh, um, pack as well and this, this is where this comes in and so take the soda and what we're going to do is as with any highball so we've done whiskey highballs before and whiskey highballs super in vogue in fashion and so again the soda water expands all the flavours and lets all that flavour bomb out and pop some in for Jake and pop some in for Pat um, <laughs> so yeah, so what we've got here now, I'm just going to give that a little stir up as well. So uh, for me, I'm using Glock Ice, so I can just literally push the cube down. It acts like a pistol and pushes all the liquid around the, uh, uh, the drink. Okay, with yours. But again, you can stir it just as much. And having really good soda is really good, so the bubbles expand in the, in the palate in this one. So cheers, guys. Here's our medal. You can pop a little lime wedge in the top of this as well, and that's your garnish. And, Mm. It's so, it's, we're going to keep using the word complex and layers of flavour because it is, it's just, you can, you can, if you spent hours you could probably define one or two things you're tasting in there, but the thing, the beauty of tiki drinks is it's just, it just, yeah, it just transports you instantly. You just, you can't imagine not being laid on a beach somewhere in Barbados or Trinidad just sipping these cocktails. So to give you an idea, so in this drink you have layers of rum, you have layers of fruit so you can start identifying passion fruit you've got that citrus pop on the passion fruit you'll get that lovely almost uh, molasses -y pomegranate and then you'll get that sweetness of the pineapple at the back of it but then the falernum comes in and you get little bits of spice in there as well and the whole thing and then right at the back 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 of the palate anise from the absolute yeah. But then you've got all the treacly, subtle layers of rum coming through it as well. And this is where the zombie comes in. And we did a drink and we served it in this. And it was six units. Uh, it was for two people, so we put two straws in. Was... And we called it the Walking Dead. It's a topical, up-to-date zombie. And uh, the Walking Dead cocktail we did in this lovely thing. And everyone bought it for themselves. No one shared it. No. And... <laughs> That's it. Um, yeah, Walking Dead. So yeah, great cocktail. Um, so yeah, so we've done most of the tasting and stuff and I just want to talk a little bit about different rum grades and different rum styles because as we've said before, there's so much involved in it and there's different grades of it, there's different classifications. So we've gone into uh, different countries and stuff like that, different age statements and um, different ABVs and the overproofs and stuff like that. But there are kind of different classifications and there's also different ways of distilling it, all these different things. It's so big, the rum category. One of the biggest categories and diverse categories in the world, yet most people only know a little bit about it. And uh, so you have things like, I'm just gonna whip through them so that we can get to the next cocktail. Getting on a bit and we've got our drink on. 
and um, it's our birthday. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's Stone Roses birthday. So yeah, we want to. We want to. <laughs> it's been a whole year. Can you believe it? <laughs> so yeah, so here we are. And uh, so white rum. We kind of touched on that. It's things like your Plantation Three Star. It's things like your Havana Club. It's something that's usually being charcoal filtered and it's it, it's it's soft and the pops on the patter it's a little bit sweeter on taste but it's a clean finish mm. um gold rum slightly aged we're getting into things like almost we're anyway, getting, sort of going Havana going up to sort of yeah talking well i guess yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. you're gonna you've got some color yeah so that's your golden rums you'll call they'll call them oros or gold so bacardi yeah. oro is one of those and they quite often have caramel added and things like that. It doesn't affect the flavour and spirit, but it's just as more of a colour mm -hmm. to trick your mind, thinking it's a bit older than it probably is. Um, but then you've also got dark rums, so that's your Gosling's Black Seals, it's your Captain Morgan Dark. It's all of those very almost British English styles. Woods, things, Woods yeah. would have been one of your classic ones. You've Woods seen. 100. Uh, yeah, my, one of my great uncles always had a bottle of Woods behind his bar at home. Yeah. One of my worst drinking stories ever involves Woods. Um, Painkiller, isn't it? That's the yeah, that's the woods oh, cocktail. I had, a fight with, I had a fight with the river taxi driver in the back of a river taxi, and a friend of mine had to take it over, and I lost everything. But anyhow, another day. Um, <laughs> that's navy strength run for you. Oh my god, I drank almost a bottle of it. Not, not too pleasant staying at a friend's guest house. Um, but anyhow, I'm going to quickly move on from that one because it's embarrassing. Um, so yeah, and uh, the other thing we've moved on to is spice drums. So, um, got a yes. new one actually. No one's got this. We've got it. Havana Club Spiced. And oh, it's delicious. It's got like guava, coconut, pineapple, all these lovely tropical flavours, bit of Madagascar and vanilla in there. Super sexy. Coming out mm -hmm. soon to the UK. And uh, yeah, we've tried this uh, earlier than anyone. Couldn't send it out because even the reps haven't tried it and they're phoning me up going, what does it taste like? And um, yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah, it's made yeah. from Havana Club's oh. seven-year-old rum as the base spirit. Yeah. And yeah, it's... that's the beautiful thing. Like the spice rum is, is, is one of those categories in bartenders where if we know rums, if the first question I'll always ask someone if they bring me a spice rum or, or a blend of rums, I go, where are the rums from? You know, now it's you can see, we understand when if someone says, well, it's from Jamaica. Okay, well, I'm going to get funk. I know it's going to be funky. Yeah. If it's from Cuba, well, it's going to be light. And a little bit floral if it's something like Barbados and it's been aged here, coconutty and spicy. Whereas a lot of spiced rums, they won't tell you or they won't say, and you sort of go, "Is it rum that it's actually in there?" Because we know the rules state that you don't have to say it's actually rum. Uh, whereas the thing I love about Havana and what they've done here is, it's it, it's a bit of a sort of, it's weird to say it. It actually tastes like spices but it does it actually the first thing I got when I tried it was like okay I'm actually getting spices I'm getting fruits I'm getting it feels like they've taken their rum which is already they've already nailed the rum they know the rum's good and they've just gone well cool well let's just lift elevate this but it's almost getting into this sort of bottled it's like a pre-bottled cocktail yeah pretty you know. much and it's it's delicious I'm really looking forward to working with this we've got some good stuff coming out this year uh, coming with this so yeah it's gonna be good fun and uh, so yeah but also there's flavored rum yeah, and so when we look at flavoured rum, it might be something like Bacardi Coconut, for instance. Yeah. It might be, that's sort of the more entry level, but then you've got exceptional flavoured rums like that, which is the Plantation Pineapple. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> talking very to you, so the guys at Koya Bar do a spiced banana rum, and as you can see, it is just, that's as tiki as fuck. It, it is. is. Yeah. That's everything that you think of when you think of tiki. So this is a phrase we use in tiki industry. It's tiki as fuck. It means it's over the top. It yeah. means that you've got just, it's just nuts. And um, we're doing the drink at the moment. And the next one, I'd say is more dialed back than that. And it's like, we've had our zombie drink. And hopefully everyone's on the way with that. And we're going to go into our banana boulevardier and so we've just talked about flavoured rums a little bit and what happens is they macerate the fruit into that in the best instances so like we talked about those different rums they put together and they macerate them in different ways they redistill them and then they blend them together and then they put them in cognac barrels like they do with plantation it's insane what they do with it and that journey the rum goes on so you have three years of, uh, of barrel aging of a product like that and then they put in the peels and they redistill that's nuts but then there's another level of nuts and I'm going to come to that next and what we've got here is super cool super topical product and it's super sustainable it's 
probably one of my favorite rum products to come out in the last couple of years that that sort of that isn't a traditional rum and is showing where rum can go and what you can do with rum it's yeah. it's bonkers good <laughs> so what i want you to do is get a rocks glass put some ice in and we're going to make a negroni style cocktail so anyone who did our gin drinks and stuff like that they all know the negroni is it's a uh, a really simple three ingredient cocktail. So the granny is gin, vermouth, campari in equal measures. It's the holy trinity of cocktails in the fact that it's so simple yet yeah, is such an exceptional drink. We're going to play around with that recipe. So what you would do is if you swap the gin out for bourbon and you had bourbon, you had um, vermouth and campari, it's called a boudabadi here. And uh, it's the same cocktail, just swapping the base spirit out, that bourbon we talked about earlier, base spirits. Um, and so, yeah, it was that. And so what we've done is your pouch number two, pour over ice and stir. Simple as that. Check your banana chips on top. I'm going to show you how to make it at home. And we're using a product which is called Discarded. And... Uh, Jake's going to tell you all about this because he's in part of what's called the 1887? 1887, yes. So this is a product yeah. from the chaps at William and Grant. So anyone that, uh, William and Grant, as the name states, they were whiskey producers, Grant Whiskey. You can still get that to this day. So William and Grant, they're one of the sort of, the, I guess you call them, if it was like the Godfather, they'd be like one of the families, wouldn't they? You've got sort yeah. of the families of boo, uh, booze distillers. You've got uh, sort of Diageo, are one of the big ones. Uh, you've got um, Perno and Ricard. Originally, Perno and Ricard came together. Uh, William and Grant's another big one. Uh, and you've got all these different families of, and they, they sort of have their, their sort of families of products. And so William and Grant, they've got lots of beautiful things, but one thing they've been doing over the last few years is, is highlighting sustainability. You know, it's, it's, it is a trigger word that you hear a lot now, but it is something that we always want to look at, especially in the bartending world, we've been looking at for the last sort of five plus years to sort of think about how can we still make great drinks, but be more conscious of what we're yeah. using, how we're using it, imports exports all that kind of stuff you know we want to use all these beautiful ingredients from all around the world but we also don't want to make sure that we kill our planet in doing it um, and discarded have been great uh, for that so they came out a few years ago with a, the first thing they created was a vermouth um, and basically they created a vermouth from cascara fruit so cascara fruits are the berries that grow on the coffee plant um, now we always use the bean that's what we use to make our coffee but the fruit and the shell of the fruit it just gets thrown away and doesn't get used and it's a discarded product but it's got flavour. It's got a, it's got loads of this complexity to it. So they they created a vermouth using it, uh, you know, a fortified wine, and then they were like, well, cool. What, what can we do next? Banana peel. Uh, no one eats banana peel. No one uses banana peel. It gets thrown away. It gets you know wasted. Uh, so they decided, but it's full of oil. It's got all the banana. It's got loads of flavour in it. It's got loads of banana flavour in it. If you ever sit, if you sit banana skins in sugar, we talk about lime sherbets and lemon sherbets. That's oil we extract from the skin of the fruit. Banana is exactly the same way. You sip banana skins and sugar, and it's gonna all this oil is gonna get extracted. And you're gonna get left with this lovely treacly banana flavor. So it's getting wasted. So essentially, what uh, William and Grant did is they took some rum. Um, so uh, so William sure Grant there in Woods 100. Woods 100. Yeah. So we're pretty sure. Uh, it, we're not sure exactly what rum, but I'm pretty damn sure it's Woods because yeah, they also flavor wise own, They also own Sailor Jerry, so Sailor got Jerry. all of these rum producers and so kind of what they did with it is they had these rum producers out in the islands and they turned around to them and they said look, we have all of this rum that's usually a redistiller, yeah, and it was that redistiller that was wasted as well, so there's double whammy on this where they had it, so mm -hmm. There would be bits they would discard or throw away. And just as when you had bananas, you would discard the skin. Hence the name where discarded come from. And uh, the lovely thing with discarded banana peel rum is it was that waste product from rum as well as that waste product from bananas. And they put the two together and created magic. I mean, this magic. It's, uh, it was one of those ones where they, they sort of teased it and you went, Oh, that's okay. going to be good and it arrived and sometimes you can have a product teased to you as a bartender it arrives and you go underwhelming or oh that's exactly what i was expecting this went above and beyond my expectations of what a product could be it is 
I can't pressure anyone enough to try and get your hands on a bottle. Buy a of this bottle. Because it is. So the actual smell of it for me, it's it's almost a, it, it's almost synthetic. So yeah, you it's... know the banana sweets, the little the bright <laughs> yellow, yellow banana foamy. sweets. Yeah, it is. When I smell this. That's all I smell. It takes me back to that childhood of nom 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 on those banana cheese. Nostalgia of banana, banana sweets. Cheese. But the flavour is so much complex. Mm. Rum hit. It's but that it's... Treak treakly molasses. Yeah. Uh, it's it's just absolutely beautiful. And you know, they, they're um, William and Grant. They're they're known for their innovation. They're known mm. for pushing the boundaries of what they do. And this is just hitting it on the nail. I cannot push pressure you enough to get your hands on a bottle of this, guys. It is delicious. And but, if you, it's just, yeah. So the thing is, when this is neat, you get a sh sharp rum hit, you get a little hint of banana, but the nose is massive, candied banana chews. Mm. Where this comes into its own is what we're about to do with it now, is cocktails. And so what we're going to do with this is I'm going to take in, so... In your pouch number two, you've got 25 millilitres of this banana peel rum. So I'm doing one for Jake and I, so it's 50. Um, we then have a red vermouth. We've used the standard, the basic uh, Martini Rosso red vermouth. It's a sweet vermouth. It comes from the word vermouth, which is one word, and it has, it's an aromatised wine. It's still one of the best in the world. It's still exceptional. And, I'm gonna uh, say, a year ago, uh, the actor Stanley Tucci did a, a, a how-to tutorial on how to make a Negroni. And yeah, you know what, literally, I love, I love you as an actor, Stanley Tucci, but you're wrong. Martini is a delicious vermouth, and I will never not use yeah. it in a cocktail. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> not being funny. It's been around almost 200 years. It's yeah. exceptional. And yeah, just because it's an entry level, it's like one of those things. It's like Havana Club is affordable yet exceptional. Beef eater gin, affordable and the world gold standard on gin, and just because something's been around and it's it's got that that massive market share for a very good reason, mm. and that very good reason is because it's bloody good, yeah. and uh, things don't get that way. It's like mm. Moet champagne. It's like some people go, mm, yeah, but it's like it's a crowd pleaser. It's everyone's favourite champagne, and. Uh, you don't get yeah. that by being a bad politician yeah, at the start. It just would never, it never lasts the distance. So the next thing we're going to do is usually we would have straight Campari in this, but that's a little bit harsh on some palates. So what I'm going to do with this is I am literally putting in 15 millilitres of Campari, and then I'm going to add in fifteen again and 20 and uh of aperol and what this does aperol is a lot uh so campari is super bitter it has bitter rhubarb all this kind of uh so many different compounds in whilst aperol's it's softer cousin and yeah uh, it is yeah it's a lesser abv on it as well but it has lovely sort of burnt rich orange flavors but because i don't want to take away from the banana in this i want to open it up i didn't want to hit too much bitter into it and then all I'm going to do is I'm just going to stir this down for a, a few seconds. And the reason we're stirring it is it controls the uh, the chilling and the dilution. And so we don't want to over chill it or over dilute it. Um, but yeah, it just becomes a really, really sexy drink. And you can do this. You can pop your pouch in the freezer and it'll be yeah. pretty much ready to go. And, uh, And this is our banana boulevard here. And uh, the longer we go on with this with more rum, that will become harder to <laughs> say. say. And this is great as well because <laughs> we've, we've highlighted two classic rum styles, a sort of tiki highball, cheers, and a daiquiri. Whereas this is taking it literally the other, the other side of the world. We're going to Italy, but it just, this is rum. And this is why I love rum. And this is why I will always love rum. It's like a Swiss army knife for me. And my statement will always be, I've never met a person that said the statement, I hate rum. I've never not found them a rum that they will enjoy. There is a rum for every single person. Whether it's a super sweet, easy to drink spice rum, uh, you vodka know. Vodka style. Vodka style rum. And my, I come from a family where they don't drink. I'm the black sheep of my family. They hate alcohol. My brother does not drink, but give him a nice spice rum, he will love it. He will drink the bottle of it. Whereas I'm going to go for your sort of more aged style rums or the more uniqueness, things like plantation pineapple. There is a rum for you out there and hopefully maybe one of these ones you've tried might be the one for you, but 
there is a run for everyone and it is it is my all-time favorite spirit I hope you like this one. It's like it's bittersweet, and it's just but it's oh. delicious and rolls off the palate. And um, yeah, it's it's the banana boulevardier. Yeah, so you can I'm throw around. Getting a bit pissed. Banana oh, 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 oh. It is. It Brown. is. Yeah. <laughs> it is delicious, and it's. I mean, we started with an aperitif cocktail, and we've arrived at an aperitif cocktail. This yeah. is. Yeah. So guys, we hope you've liked the rum journey we've taken you on. Go and explore rum, and uh, there are so many out there. I mean, we've got a few up here. So. Oh, it's I'm gonna. I mean, we've shown you that 15 year old, but there's things like plantain, plantation Examaca, plantation Isle of Fiji, bonkersly good. They've just got everything. I mean, Bacardi. We talk about you know flavors. You've got Bacardi with their coconut expression. You know, I mean, as the name states. You know, you Bit can't go wrong with a you can't go wrong with a decent pina colada made with this. Yeah, but you've got Coco Candy, which is Coco Candy again. Uh, um, can, can I, I mean, we yeah. could we could do a week's worth of masterclass just talking through the different styles of rum that exist out there, and and there was uh, I mean, I'd say if you are a rum, uh, if you're an avid rum fan, come here, come to Halulu, try their their spirits, what they do. If you're not unfortunately not in the Devon area, places I'd recommend. There's a bar in trailer. London, Trailer Happiness. Uh, so Trailer Happiness is great because the chap that uh, looks after Plantation, part owner, part owner of it. And honestly, as a rum geek, the first time Paddy took me there, you sort of go down the stairs. It's an underground bar. You look at their back bar, and your jaw just drops because they have got everything, every kind of style of rum. I mean, they've got rums from Japan. They've got rums from everywhere. Um, so if you are an avid rum fan, definitely. Lucky Cane as well. Lucky Cane. Yeah. If you like your tiki, you like yeah. that sort of classic. Awesome. You know, escapism, lackey cane, definitely. And actually, if you want to go old school, if you want to go original, uh, the Trader Vic, uh, who created the Mai Tai, he, his bar that they opened in the 1960s is still going. Yeah. You can still go to the original tiki, one of the original tiki bars so in I, London. I did a corporate masterclass and I mentioned about uh, Trader Vic's. And um, one of the older gentlemen on this corporate masterclass going, isn't that where all the Russian prostitutes are? <laughs> um, it was amazing watching on a Zoom call with like 40 people on it and suddenly all these heads go, you're what? <laughs> and they was like, how do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like there falling over on the floor laughing going, oh my God, yeah. Amazing. But, but yeah, yes, definitely, um, it definitely is go Russian there. Prostitute stuff. Um, <laughs> if, you are, if you're like myself, if you like your, your books, if you like to read about this stuff and learn about it, the books I would recommend. So Paddy mentioned Imbibe by David Wondrich. That chap is a is, is the geekiest of geeks when it comes to uh, cocktail stuff. We know some stuff that was lost to history because of the research he did. Yeah. And if you like rum and you like uh, tiki stuff, um, a chap by the name of Jeff Beach Bunbury, yeah. he is, we, we know the zombie recipe because of him. We know Mai Tai recipes because of him. These, these drinks got lost to time and they got lost uh, to people just forgetting them or forgetting the specs or, or, you know, people wouldn't share their secrets of how the drinks were made. This chap- he Designed the tiki mug. Designed the tiki mug. He spent years, I mean, literally like 10 years of his life going to these places, learning these drinks. Uh, so he's got a couple of books out. He's got Sipping Safari yep. and uh, Potions of the Caribbean. And they are incredible because they show the history of, not just the history of tiki, but the history of rum, the history of Caribbean cocktails. Of Caribbean he's drinks. He's also got one of the world's best tiki bucks. Yeah, he has. Latitude, so latitude, uh, latitude 49. 29. 29. 29. 29. Fuck knows. Fuck knows. Uh, yeah. uh, Boulevard. Too much rum. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty out there, guys. Like I said, we have scratched the surface. But if you were hesitant about rum or you you thought you knew it but maybe weren't quite sure about what you were drinking, hopefully this has just opened your mind a little yeah. bit. And yeah, feel free to pop in any time and once we've, once we've finally got our doors back open. Yeah, and it's like, and this has been, I've, I've really enjoyed this one. It's our first birthday. We've saved doing a overall rum masterclass for so long. We wanted a really good special occasion for it. And yeah. there's a couple of reasons as well. I mean, Jake's leaving me. Yes, uh, I am, guys. I, I will say to anyone watching this, one of my regulars at Stir Crazy or watching uh, that's been, you know, a regular at Dr. Inks, um, I am actually, I am going to be leaving, unfortunately. <laughs> I decided a pandemic was the best time. Off to the big smoke. Off to the big smoke. I'm going to be moving to London. Um, I'm going to be moving away from, from rum, actually. Yeah. And, and, and Tiki, I'm going to be uh, joining the chaps at Homeboy Bar at Embassy Gardens, their new site that they're going to be opening. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, being in London has been one of my goals since I first got into this industry. It's always been the goal. I made that very clear when I, yeah. you know, when I joined Dr. Inks. And the chaps, uh, you know, Paddy, uh, Tom, the other owners, all the guys at Doctoring, Sophie, our manager, they've been 
nothing but supportive in my growing and, and letting me do this, keeping myself going over the last year. A lot of bartenders I know have been stuck in their houses making banana bread or sourdough, not doing anything, but the last year I've been able to keep doing what I do best. Um, so yeah, so unfortunately you're not going to be seeing my face as much with Stir Crazy anymore. Hopefully maybe I'll come back at some road point trip. For, for, a, for a road <laughs> trip. You, um, you might see a Stir Crazy from Stir a... Stir Crazy from... road trip, we get a bus, <laughs> we'll figure it out. We go up to London and we drive them nuts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they will. No, but honestly, to everyone watching, guys, to everyone that's taken part over the last year, it's been an, you've been an absolute godsend. You know, a lot of people have gone quite literally stir crazy over this year, not yeah. being able to do what we do. And we, the reason we're still we've never able, worked so hard. Never worked so hard. It's been a learning curve. Well, work hard. You know, it's like it's it's been badass. It's it like, has. You know, from taking it from forty boxes, and literally, you know, this time a year ago, doing forty boxes up to I think we were. Five, six hundred boxes at one point. Seven hundred. It was yeah, every uh, week. That was a tough week. Uh, you know, to, to all sorts of stuff. To everyone that you've supported us from the start, that you're still here now, and all our new customers that have you know joined us recently over the last few months. Thank you so much for uh, for taking part in this. You've been you know you've kept us all sane and <laughs> doing and, what we do best. And the other thing is, stir crazy is evolving. It's like we're coming out of lockdowns. We 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 own bars. This is what we are. We're bartenders. We want to. Mm be there with customers. I mean, one of the joys that both Jake and I had over Christmas and whatnot, we were in front of customers, we were doing corporate masterclasses. Yeah. We had a Zoom chat, so you're interacting with people whilst you're making drinks. I'm not just talking to a camera as we are now. And we can't wait to get back to being customer face forward. And our industry is one of those industries that has been gagging to open. Every person I speak to in the industry, they can't wait to get back in front of the customers. We're all a bit showy, we're all a bit theatrical, and uh, yeah, we, we want to yeah. have a laugh. We, we want to have a laugh. We miss you guys, we miss customers. doing what we do best. We got into this industry because we love doing what we do. Yeah. We, we're clearly geeks about this stuff, we can talk about it all day long, but we love best is just serving you guys the drinks yeah. and, sh and putting it into our cocktails and stuff like that. And you know, here, whether it's here, Dr. Inks, Halulu, where, you know, where I'm going to be, wherever, it doesn't matter. We just want our bars back open. And, and it's nice to know, seeing these and seeing you guys getting involved in this, that you're still ready for that and you still want that back as well. And hopefully a year down the line, it's like when you come into a bar, you'll have a clue about what you're ordering. And uh, you've come on this journey with us, so thank you. Yeah. And it's our birthday and we are super proud of what we've achieved over the last year. We have a lot of new things coming up. We've obviously got Halulu opening. Um, we have a new thing called Dark Bar Drinks. That's all I'm saying on it now. It's called Dark Bar Drinks. It's, yeah, it's a game changer, but it's it's cool. Um, so we've got that coming out very, very, very soon, and we'll be talking about that at some point. But the first thing we want to do is get our bars open, keep our staff safe, and keep our customers safe. We want to have fun. And so we're going to have DJs at Halulu. We're going to have outdoor parties. We're going to have everything we can do to make drinking fun again. And we want to get back to that thing. We're on a beach, it's summertime, let's party. And uh, I look forward to seeing you. And I'm God, we've got an amazing team behind Halulu here. Dr. Inks will open later in the summer when we can do it safely and it will be awesome again. We've got so many crazy ideas. Dr. Inks is evolving into something we've never had before. And we're taking influence from fashion and all sorts of uh, cultural things and everything as well and it's going to be nuts and uh, although Jake isn't there along for us Jenny is still a spiritual partner with us he knows a lot of what we're going to be doing there and uh, he's been part of that journey for us and I I love as a bar owner seeing people who've grown on a journey through us through the bars develop their skills develop everything is and then watching them go on to take the big steps up to the big smoke, which invariably happens. And I never begrudge it because it's like a proud father watching them go off to college and- uh, Not knowing uh, what we're walking into. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they're walking into. I did 20 years of it. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's part of their growth. And I've had bartenders of mine over the years who've come on some of the world's best bartenders. I'm a proud daddy of those and I'm not jealous. I never am. And I remember talking to old bar managers of mine when they're, bartenders were doing better than them in competitions. I was like, take their wins as your wins. It's watch them grow. It's it's amazing to watch. And so, yeah, we're no, gonna so, miss Jake. Yeah, yeah, and I'm gonna miss it, guys. I'm gonna miss you guys. I'm gonna miss my regulars at Dr. Inks. You know, uh, it's a shame that I couldn't actually say farewell properly in the bar while it was still reopened. 
But I, I'm, I'll, I'll inevitably be back at some point. You're not going up till what May or May? May, I think. I, yeah, May is May is when I'll be I'll be heading up there. I actually start on my actual birthday, so that's hilarious. Uh, as long as Bojo lets us reopen. <laughs> So we might get a drink down here. We open on the 12th of April at Halulu, God willing. And uh, yeah, yeah, we're looking forward to it. We've got a new drinks list, we've got new cocktails, we've got uh, some of the old team and a whole load of new team and they're uh, cracking. So yeah, guys, it's gonna come be, join us for a beer. Come, come bring in the summer, bring in, you know, this, this, let's, you know, safely and with, within reason, say goodbye to this year and, and let's, let's, yeah, let's go forward. Uh, yeah, there's gonna be some exciting stuff coming up. And yeah. like I said, we will say no more about Dark Bar, but just keep an eye on our socials, you know, and we will we will say more when, when the time is And as for the one thing that is the dark nonsense of this year, Corona, mm. uh, we have a saying which is AMF in the bar trade, which means adios, adios motherfucker. motherfucker. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's all we're going to say, yeah. and that's all we're going to finish on. Thank you very, very much for taking part in our Run Masterclass listening to Jake and I prattle on. We, we're really pleased to do this. We obviously in a work bubble. So this was the original plan yeah. with Stir Crazy before restrictions came in and stuff like that. We were going to do uh, team up masterclasses, but then they were like, no, you can't. I mean, working, you know, 20 meters apart in a bar, you know, where we're on one side, nice. you're on the other side. And it's been nice to actually finally on this one, uh, get together and do this together, guys. Yeah, it's been, like I said, I can't thank everyone enough. And the people that started at, right at the start that are still with us now, to the people that have joined us along the way. Cheers, Cheers. everyone. Thank you for keeping us sane. And hopefully we've stopped you going stir crazy. Mm. And we will see you all very, very soon. See you soon, guys. Cheers. Cheers.